Um, I just wanted to say a very good hello and good evening to everybody present here for the discussion of the vision of independent India, Rana Day, Tilak, and Gokhale. And we have here with us our esteemed panelists, Justice A.S. Oka of the Supreme Court and um, Senior Advocate Aditya Sondi. The leaflet is excited and proud to host this event and all of our over 500 viewers on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and other social media who are joining us and who have registered for this program. For those of you who are new here, the leaflet is an independent platform for a cutting edge progressive legal opinion analysis and reportage. In our reporting, we uphold the values of the constitution first. We are strongly committed to independent journalism, which we believe to be a robust pillar of any democracy. And we contribute to this through high quality and accurate reporting. Only four years old, the leaflet was founded in May 2018. In these short years, we have cemented its name firmly as a legal news analysis force to reckon with, filling the gap between news reporting and legal news analysis by providing independent, legally sound examination, which goes beyond mere court reporting. In our endeavor to provide the latest legal news, analysis, and opinions, we have been working over time to enhance our user experience. We recently launched our new website, which is sleeker, faster, and easier to navigate. We are also excited to launch a new mobile app by the end of the month, which will bring you Leaflet on the go. Of course, this high quality news analysis and opinions are brought to you only after the careful scrutiny and eagle eye of our veteran editor, Mr. V. Venkateshan. Mr. Venkateshan is a pioneer of legal journalism with over 30 years of experience including 27 years with The Frontline. Since his retirement from Frontline as its senior editor in 2020, he has been contributing to The Wire as its legal editor on contemporary issues. Mr. Venkateshan, I invite you to share your opening remarks on the topic at hand. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Leaflet's special uh, discussion today. As you all know, today's talk is on the vision of India. Uh, centered around the three great leaders of the Indian freedom movement, uh, Mahade Govind Dharanade, Balaganga Tilak, and Gopal Krishna Gokhale. One wonders what actually brought these leaders together and what is the connection between the vision of India. So uh, we, we are all uh, waiting and uh, very curious to listen to Justice Voka to explain the relevance and significance of uh, these leaders for the contemporary times. And before I, I uh, hand over the uh, uh, <clears throat> platform to others, uh, let me just explain to you a little bit about the significance of the talk as I understand it. You know, modern Indian political thought has great relevance in the contemporary times. It was, in the sense, a response to the colonial uh, uh, colonial issues, you know, it was born around that time. But the leaders of the modern, the, uh, the modern Indian political thinkers, as we call them today, they went beyond the immediate confines of colonialism. And they articulated their views on so other issues as well. And what makes the modern Indian political thought unique is that most of these thinkers practiced, especially Mahatma Gandhi and others, they practiced what they preached. So looking at it from the contemporary times, contemporary Indian political thought also has many strands. Modern Indian political thought, as we uh, understand it during the freedom struggle, also has a lot of strands, you know, liberalism, conservatism, and things like that. So if you look at the three leaders which we are going to discuss this evening, except Tilak, the other two were considered as moderates. Tilak was by and large an extremist. And you know, he, uh, he was engaged in a bitter polemics against his moderate opponents. Although he was aggressive and defiant, he was not vain and arrogant. He was a cultured gentleman. He was a leader with the biting tongue and mobilizer of strong men who disrupted the meetings of others and threatened violence to the rivals. With the passage of time, however, Tilak 
mellowed and his temper calmed down. So we have this kind of a, a, a tradition in, during the freedom struggle where we find that mod, moderation giving place to extremism and then, you know, uh, there is a lot of fusion, fusion of ideas. So I, I, I join others, uh, the other listeners, um, uh, to make, in welcoming all the uh, main speakers, Justin Woka and Mr. Aditya Sombi. Uh, and we are waiting to listen to their erudite speeches uh, this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Venkateshan, for those thoughtful remarks. I will now introduce you to Apurva Vishwanath. Ms. Vishwanath is an assistant editor with the Indian Express and primarily writes about law and the judiciary. A lawyer by training, she has previously worked with Mint and The Print. She is the moderator for this evening's discussion. I leave you in her capable hands. Over to you, Ms. Vishwanath. Thank you, Ulmas. Uh, it's a privilege to be here today and share space with our wonderful speakers. And also to be part of this space, Indira and Anand have over the years created and nurtured for um, free, rational, and very productive conversations. Uh, so as I begin to understand the topic that is up for discussion, uh, this conversation is particularly relevant today of the idea of India, that is of Gokhale's, Renade's, and Tilak's. Um, to put it rather simplistically, uh, the debate between the social moderates who saw uh, social change and movement towards a liberal construct uh, as a prerequisite perhaps for self-determination and assertion. And what Tilak represented, um, that being free from self-loathing, emphasizing Indian values, and perhaps being free from Western constructs of liberalism itself as self-assertion. Uh, for the judiciary, we've seen a live expression of this in the Sabrimala debate. Uh, yet, despite this relevance, none of these uh, leaders today seem to have a specific place in the current political, political conversation. Uh, take the populist religious right or the liberal left, which is also populist, or the distinct regional parties, uh, even in the states from where they come from. So, I look to the speakers today to understand this polarity and what this means for the idea of India today. Uh, I'm simply here to facilitate this conversation. Uh, and with this, I should introduce our two wonderful speakers without much delay. Uh, first, we have Justice Abhay Oak, Judge of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, Justice Oak enrolled as an advocate in 1983. Uh, and started his practice in Thane District Court in the chambers of his father, uh, Srinivaso. He was elevated as an additional judge of the Bombay High Court uh, in 2003. And in 2019, he took oath as the Chief Justice of the Karnataka High Court. Uh, and just last year, he was appointed a judge of the Supreme Court. Justice Oak's extraordinary tenure as a judge is marked by his stress on protecting civil liberties, um, which we saw greatly during his stint in the Karnataka High Court, uh, when the COVID crisis unfolded and changed the lives of ordinary people as we know. Um, we know we were all crushed under the lockdown and the dread of the disease. Justice Oak's courtroom in Karnataka was a rare and much needed glimmer of hope. Um, on behalf of the leaflet, I welcome Justice Oak. Uh, over to you, sir. Good evening. Uh, the office bearers of the leaflet, Sri Aditya Sundi, Senior Advocate, Ms. Apurva Vishwanath, Assistant Editor, The Indian Express, Ladies and Gentlemen. I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to express my personal views on vision of independent India, Ranade, Tirak, and Gokhale. In the second half of 19th century, Maharashtra gave the nation a galaxy of social reformers, philosophers, activists, and freedom fighters. It is always a great learning experience to study the thoughts of Mahatma Jyotiba Phule, Narayan Meghaji Lokhande, Lokahitavadi Gopal Hari Deshmukh, Gopal Ganesh Agarkar, 
जस्टिस महादेव गोविंद रानडे गोपाल कृष्ण गोखले एंड बार गंगाधर टिड़क टू नेम ए फ्यू ऑल ऑफ देम वेर बॉर्न इन नाइनटीन सेंचुरी टूडे आई एम कन्फाइनिंग माई सेल्फ टू द विजन ऑफ थ्री स्टालवर्स जस्टिस रानडे टिड़क एंड गोखले ऑफ ए फ्री एंड इंडिपेंडेंट इंडिया टूडे वी आर नॉट गोइंग टू डिस्कस पॉलिटिक्स दो वी कैन से दैट गोखले and Tirak were politicians we are going to discuss only the academic point of view i am not a historian but as a student of history i continue to read about these great personalities what i am going to say today is my understanding of the thoughts of the three great personalities after reading their articles speeches and writings what i i am going to express today may not be accurate i know that there can always be another point of view justice mahadev govind ranade was the eldest of the three he was born in 1842 15 years before the mutiny of 1857 this background we must know to understand his thought process when we consider his thoughts we must remember that Justice Ranade was in the judicial service of the British government. There were constraints on him due to the judicial offices held by him. Apart from being a great judge, he was called the father of Indian economics. He was an activist, a social reformer, and a great human being, having highest intellect. Most importantly, he was liberal. His liberal ideas and views can be seen in his writings. and speeches even with the constraint of judicial offices held by him his contribution to social and religious reforms was enormous he once said that slowly but surely the progress of liberal ideas be allowed to work its way into reforming our social customs and the process cannot be stopped though we may wish it his motto for the reforms movement was humanize equalize and sympathize while he was posted as a sub judge in pune in the year 1970 he co-founded an organization which is very well known sarvajanik sabha the object of forming the said organization was to provide a platform to take up with the british government the demands and grievances of citizens and farmers it is on the platform of this institution that justice ranade read papers on economics he propagated that indian economy was peculiar and needed policies fitting its conditions he believed that presuppositions of classical economics did not suit india's needs in 1892 just one year before his elevation as a judge of the bombay high court he read a paper titled indian political economy at the deccan college union pune in this speech he boldly described india's worsening economic industrial agricultural and financial situation from the platform of the sarvajanik sabha justice ranade highlighted the plight of farmers the unjust regime of agricultural tax the exploitation of the farmers by money lenders in 1877 through the said organization justice ranade addressed letter to the british government on the occasion of a darbar scheduled to be held by the the then viceroy mr lytton in the said letter he propagated the idea of representatives of indian people coming together and exchanging their views in 1891 he prepared a detailed report on conditions created in various districts due to famine his association with the said institution led to the unique experiment of setting up arbitral tribunals to resolve civil disputes by private settlement perhaps we need to study this model he was a co-founder of the indian national congress do later on british government banned participation of public servants in congress 
Justice Ranade attended few sessions of the Congress as an observer. Justice Ranade lived in an era when there were princely states in India. In January 1880, he wrote an article titled Constitution for the Native States. He discussed in detail the concept of constitution for Indian native states. His idea was to provide a responsible government for the people supported by a constitution in Indian native states. Late Maharaja Baroda offered Justice Ranade the post of Diwan of Baroda state. He addressed a detailed letter to Maharaja declining the offer. While declining the offer, he suggested that the Maharaja should decentralize the power. His suggestion to the Maharaja was to constitute municipalities. He advised Maharaja that he should consider of having a constitution for the Baroda state. Importantly, in this letter, he was at pains to explain that even while working with the British government, he never bartered his freedom for any personal considerations. He addressed several yearly social conferences. His speeches at the conferences show that his concept of social reforms was not limited to changing religious customs. His idea of reforms directly connects with equality, the dignity of human beings, and the natural rights of human beings. At the seventh social conference held in Lahore, he invited attention to the violation of the rights of human beings in every household. He pointed out that ordinary human rights were denied to various sections of the society. He said that when we were not bothered about the injustice done to them, even if political rights were conferred on Indian citizens, they would find it difficult to preserve the rights. In one of his speeches, he pleaded that there was nothing wrong if social reforms were assured through legislation made by the British government. In the social conference held in 1892 at Allahabad, he pleaded importance of tolerance, forbearance, and rational thinking. He asserted that instead of blindly following someone, there was a need to do rational thinking. In 1899, at the 13th social conference held in Lucknow, he took the opportunity to advise Hindus and Muslims to introspect. He expressed concern about the lack of importance of individual rights, the failure to understand the importance of science and technology and disrespect for women in both the religions. He appealed to Hindus and Muslims to remain united. In a true sense, he was a liberal and he always faced criticism with dignity. When Lokmane Turk wrote a very strongly worded article in his newspaper criticizing Justice Ranade, some of his well-wishers advised him not to tolerate the insult and proceed in the court of law by filing an action for defamation. The response of Justice Zanare to the said suggestion was most dignified. The response shows his love for the freedom of expression and human dignity. He informed his advisors that Tilak was a great patriot. He said that both of them were fighting for the same cause, but their methods were different. He stated that if there was a legal battle between him and Tirath, the Britishers would take undue advantage. Moreover, he said that he would instead introspect when a very independent and learned person like Tirath has found fault with him. His vision of economic reforms is very significant. He always considered agricultural reforms as a part of broader economic reforms. His demand was for a grant of agricultural loans to farmers and subsidized rate interest rates. He pleaded the need to create a fund for a grant of loan waiver to poor farmers. 
he gave example of hungary where loan was being granted to the farmers at a subsidized interest rate of 4.5% he also gave figures to prove that though the funds were available with indian banks they did not infuse sufficient capital into agriculture he pleaded the need to spend more on irrigation his emphasis was on the modernization of agriculture and setting up industries he asserted that people should use a part of their savings for investing it as capital in the local industries or trade he pleaded that an open economy was not suitable for our country and he called for the intervention of the government in setting up local industries to indicate the approach of justice ranade i cannot resist the temptation of quoting what justice ranade reported he said in one of the lectures delivered by him he said and i quote we have above all to learn what is to bear and forbear to bear ridicule insults and even personal injuries at times and forbear from returning abuse for abuse he further says in the words of prophet nazareth we have to take up the cross not because it is pleasant to be persecuted but because the pain and injury are as nothing by the side of principle for which they are endured please remember that justice ranade died in 1901 today in 2022 some of his thoughts are as modern as possible bal gangadhar tilak known as lokmanya tilak was born in the year 19 in the year 1856 he enjoyed a relatively long life till 1920 after completing his ba and llb he devoted his time and energy to establishing new english school in pune along with eminent personalities like vishnu krishna chipronkar gopa ganesh agarkar and others his idea was that young indian graduates should come together and run education and institutions for imparting national education and he expected them to work at a minimum salary he was described as the father of indian unrest by sir valentine chirol he had to face two trials for the offense of sedition for his editorials in his newspaper and had to undergo conviction and imprisonment in both trials lokmanya's role as a freedom fighter is well known his work editorials in newspapers and speeches show his vision of an independent india in 1918 he visited england for prosecuting the case filed by him against sir valentine chirol for defamation one of his biographies notes that after he came back from england he reportedly said that there should be a place in india like like hyde park where people can freely address their fellow citizens he had written several articles on the plight of farmers in india and in particular the farmers in maharashtra there is one article written by him in marathi on 20th april 1920 on the policies of the democratic party as some of you must be aware that he had formed the democratic party within the indian national congress in the said article he has set out the aims and policies of his party some of the policies of his party as set out by him are very relevant i'll quote some of the policies which he had set out he says salaries of the workers working in agriculture and industry should be commensurate with their work the workers should be paid minimum wages and should have reasonable working hours there should be a mechanism to resolve the disputes 
between workers and owners of industries. Encouragement should be given to local industries by providing monetary help and other incentives through the state. There should be nationalization of all private railway companies. There should be reduction of expenditure on all government departments and especially the military. The appointment of government servants should be by competitive examinations. He pleaded need to abolish bonded labor. He said that adequate freedom should be provided for local self-governments. Compulsory free education should be provided to boys and girls. Creation of health department for improving public health. He pleaded use of modern scientific methods for improving public health. As I read, he had said that salaries of workers working in agriculture and industry should be commensurate with their work. He pleaded need to have basic minimum wages for the workers. This has some significance because I remember to have read that after he was convicted in the second case, second sedition case, the mill workers in Bombay went on strike as a mark of protest. These are the progressive policies formulated more than 100 years ago with some of his vision of an independent India. What appeals to me is his views on freedom of speech and expression and freedom of the press. We must remember that based on his editorials written in his newspaper Kesri, he faced two trials for the offense of sedition under section 124A of the Indian Penal Code. Firstly, he was prosecuted for an article written by him. In the said article, he strongly condemned the British government and the methods adopted by Mr. Rand to curb plague pandemic in Pune city. On 20th July 1897, he wrote an important article in Marathi titled, What is Sedition? He has discussed the issue of interpretation of section 124A of IPC in detail in this article. He says that everyone has a right to criticize the government in the strongest terms. He stated that only doing something to overthrow the rulers would be sedition. He said in the article that British rulers did not have monopoly of wisdom and sometimes even they commit mistakes due to which the citizens suffered. He stated that expressing dissatisfaction about the British government or its officials will not amount to an offense of sedition. He concluded the article by saying that the times are changing. Therefore, those who strongly criticize British government's officers for their unjust conduct cannot be charged with sedition. All of us are aware that in the second sedition trial held against him in the year 1908, Justice Dawar sentenced him to undergo transportation for six years. Lokmanya argued in person at length in his defense. His address to the members of the jury is very relevant, in which he discusses the law relating to sedition. He pleaded that offending articles written by him do not excite dissatisfaction. In his address to the jury, he has discussed the scope of explanation 1 and 2 to section 124A. I cannot avoid the temptation of quoting what he said in his address to the jury, and I quote, a writer can do something more, not merely represent and express. I can say something is bad. It ought to be remedied. I have to write. I have a right to do that. And as I find fault, it is only natural. Some ill will is created. We are not all saints. So in disapprobation, some ill feeling is implied necessarily, then that is the meaning of the explanation too. When I say this, 
government is going wrong evidently i say something which the authorities may not like that is not sedition if that were so there would be no progress at all and we shall have to be as content at the end of 20th century as we are at present true progress lies through agitation and you are bound to consider what the defects are pointed out and discuss and the reforms which are proposed and look to the real intention of the man the real intention and not fictitious intention which is inferred from legal dictum that every man intends the consequences of his action that is the criterion if the intention is really to reform government it is not sedition a man must make an attempt to excite with a view to bring government into contempt before he is seditious what is the wording in the section sedition has never been really properly defined he further says i cannot conceive disapprobation without exciting some bad feeling in the minds of the hearer or the person against whom that comment is made it is impossible to do it that explanation is there to show that we allow such and such liberty to the press or it has no meaning i request you to take it that it has a meaning for the legislature was not certainly unsound in mind the section was not meaninglessly introduced if it has a meaning the only meaning it can have is that a certain amount of unpleasant feeling is allowed to be created by law he told jury that the issue was not about tirth as an individual but it was a national issue he emphasized that the liberty enjoyed by people of england should be available to the people of india in his address to the jury he stated that he had consciously written the articles further he adds an i quote i have not come here to ask you any grace i am prepared to stand by the consequences of my acts there is no question about it i am not going to tell you that i wrote these articles in a fit of madness i am not a lunatic i have written it believing it my duty to write in the interest of public in this way believing that that was the community that was the view of the community i wanted to express it believing that interest of the community cannot be otherwise safeguarded believe me when i say that it was both in the interest of people and the government that this view should be placed before them if you honestly go to the question like that it will be your opinion even if you dislike me as much as you can i know i am not a persona grata with the government but that is no reason why i should not have justice that is not the question the question is of intention what you have to decide is the fact under the direction of his lordship lastly he told the members of the jury that the liberty of the press depends on them perhaps lokmanya used this opportunity to address the court to canvas his views about the freedom of speech and expression and more importantly the freedom of press his address to the members of the jury is his vision of freedom of speech and expression in other way it is his vision of free and independent india gopal krishna gokhale was born in 1866 and died in 1915 he after his graduation joined the group of young graduates consisting of tilak agarkar and others and started working in deccan education society's new english school by accepting a token salary 
Later on, he worked as a professor at Ferguson College, again set up by Deccan Education Society. When he stepped down as a professor at Ferguson College, I am told that he drew a monthly salary of only Rs. 75. Apart from being a politician, who was the president of the Indian National Congress, he was a social reformer. As all of us know, he was the founder of Servants of India Society. Apart from being professor at Ferguson College at Pune, Gokhale was initially a member of Bombay Legislative Council for two years. He was, the, he was a member of the Imperial Legislative Council from 1902. His erudite speeches on budget and addresses on various bills placed before the council are very well known. He presided over the Indian National Congress session held in Banaras in 1905. He strongly criticized Lord Curzon in his speech. He criticized budget submitted by Lord Curzon. What was vital in his presidential address was what he said about the concept of Swadeshi movement. He was at pains to explain that Swadeshi movement is not only a patriotic movement, but it is also an economic movement. He talked about aspirations of the citizens of India. When we read what he said, we have to remember that he has said it way back in 1905. In his speech in Banaras, he expressed his idea of self-governance by Indians in some detail. He said, and I quote, the goal of the Congress is that India should be governed in the interest of Indians themselves and that in course of time, form a government should be attained in this country similar to what exists in self-governing colonies of British Empire. For better, for worse, our destinies are now linked with those of England. And the Congress freely recognizes that whatever advance we seek must be within the empire itself. That advance, moreover, can be only gradual, as at each stage of the progress, it may be necessary for us to pass through a brief course of apprenticeship before we are enabled to go to the next one. For it is a reasonable proposition that the sense of responsibility required for the proper exercise of the political institutions of the West can be acquired by Eastern people through practical training and experiment only. To admit this is not to express any agreement with those who usually oppose all attempts at reform on the plea that the people are not ready for it. It is the liberty alone, says Mr. Gladstone, in the words of profound wisdom, which fits men for liberty. This proposition, like every other politics, has its bounds, but it is far safer than counter doctrine wait till they are fit. While therefore we are prepared to allow that an advance towards our goal may be only by reasonably cautious steps, what we emphatically insist on is that resources of the country should be primarily devoted to the work of qualifying people by means of education and in other ways for such advance. In this context, Rana, in this context, Gokhale expresses a concern that a very insignificant part of the budget was utilized for education. Gokhale advocated that the sense of responsibility required for running democratic institutions can be acquired only by practical training and education. That is why he stated that the resources available in the country should be primarily devoted to the work of qualifying people through education. His view was that the process of conferring freedom 
should be taken step by step and in the meanwhile the citizens should get equipped to run the democratic institutions he laid stress on imparting primary education on a large scale and providing industrial and technical education facilities it is in the same speech he stressed the need of separating judicial and executive functions in march 1910 he moved a resolution in the imperial legislative council on education he wanted the government to make a law conferring powers on the local authorities to make primary education free and compulsory on 16 march 2011 he presented a private bill in the legislature providing for compulsory primary education in the bill he had made a provision for free education to the children belonging to financially weaker sections as expected by him the bill was defeated on the floor of the imperial legislative council his response to this defeat was very dignified he said that his generation could only hope to serve the country through their failures his struggle for compulsory education was in a way a significant part of freedom struggle 92 years after that 86th amendment of the constitution came which introduced article 21a the legislation came 98 years after bokles private bill this is the vision of this great man in 2000 in, in 1910 and 2011 he wanted to introduce a law which will provide for compulsory primary education he read an important paper on the question of elevation of depressed classes at a social conference held in darwad on 27th april 1903 he referred to the resolution proposed to be passed in the said conference and criticized it because it was not strongly worded what he said on the subject deserves to be quoted and i quote i only want to make few general observations from the standpoint of justice humanity and national self interest i think all fair minded persons will have to admit that it is absolutely monstrous that a class of human beings with bodies similar to our own with brains that can think and with hearts that can feel should be perpetually condemned to a low life of servitude and mental and moral degradation and that permanent barriers should be placed in their way so that it should be impossible for them to overcome them and improve their lot this is deeply revolting to our sense of justice i believe one has to put oneself mentally into their place to realize how grievous this injustice is in the same speech he gives example of mr chamberlain by stating that he was a shoe maker at one point of time he pointed out that mr chamberlain regularly dines with the royalty he wondered whether a shoe maker in india would ever be able to rise in the social scale in a similar fashion he urged that elevation of depressed classes is a question of national interest he further says and i quote finally gentlemen this is a question of national self interest how can we possibly realize our national aspirations how can our country ever hope to take her place among the nations of the world if we allow large numbers of our countrymen to remain sunk in ignorance barbarism and degradation unless these men are gradually raised to a raised to a higher level how can they possibly understand our thoughts or share our hopes or cooperate with us in our efforts can you not realize that so far as the work of national elevation is concerned 
the energy which these classes might be expected to represent is simply unavailable to, unavailable to us. He ended his speech by appealing to educated Indians to take it upon themselves to dedicate their lives to the work of elevation of depressed classes. Some of his speeches show the influence of John Stuart Mill. His liberal views are reflected in what he said about Swadeshi movement. He was of the view that there should not be an appeal to boycott foreign goods. He believed that the word boycott implies vindictive desire to injure another. He suggested that while participating in Sadeshi movement, one should not create ill will. He said that one should not make ourselves ridiculous by stating in the resolution of not even touching foreign made goods. While opposing the amendment to Official Secrets Act, on 4 December 1903, before the Imperial Legislative Council, Gokhale said, and I quote, the vigilance of the press is the only check that operates from outside. Feebly, it is true, but continuously upon the conduct of the government, which is subject to no popular control. It is here, therefore, if anywhere, that the legislature should show special consideration to the press and yet here alone, it is proposed to arm government with a greater power to control the freedom of the press than in any other part of the empire. My Lord, we often hear government complaining of the distrust shown by the people in this country and the people complaining of the government not trusting them enough. In such a situation where again, the question is further complicated by tendency on the part of the government to attach undue importance to race or class considerations. The wisest and safest and most statesman like course for it is to conduct its civil administration as far as possible in the light of day. The press is, in one sense, like the government, a custodian of public interests and any attempt to hamper its freedom by representative legislation is bound to affect these interests prejudicially and cannot fail in the end to react upon the position of the government itself. So like Lokmanyatra, Gokhale also believed in freedom of press. Justice Ranade and Gokhale propagated more than 100 years back the importance of liberal thinking and liberal approach. Their views on economy and education continue to guide us. And what they propounded continues to be very relevant even after 75 years of independence. I feel that we need to revisit Ranade and Gokhale for guidance and course correction. As I said a few minutes back, their thoughts are very modern and therefore they are relevant even today. Both Ranade and Gokhale believe that reforms in our society must get priority and they strongly felt that the British government's laws can bring in reforms. Though they believe that India must become an independent nation. Their emphasis on, was on social reforms. Gokhale and Ranade believed that priority should be given to social reforms and economic reforms so that the freedom will be more effective. Justice Ranade and Gokhale laid emphasis on free and compulsory education. As far as social reform is concerned, the views of Lokmanya were quite different. But Lokmanya was a firm believer in freedom of speech and expression. While facing both the trials, he fought for the freedom of press and freedom of speech and expression. 
what he pleaded in the second trial held in the year 1908 continues to be relevant 114 years after his trial. I selected this subject as I felt that we have entirely forgotten the vision of these three great gentlemen who devoted their lives to public service. We must revisit more than century old speeches and writings of so many such great personalities and we can learn so much from their work and vision. I again thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my few thoughts on these three great gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was wonderful listening to you. Uh, you talked about sedition, press freedom, economic reforms, and most importantly, education. Uh, as some of the aspects of reforms that we need to revisit and uh, perhaps look back and learn from what Rana Ray, Gokhale and Tilak taught us. Um, thank you for uh, speaking to us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, I'd now like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Aditya Somni. Uh, Dr. Somni is a senior advocate practicing before the High Court of Karnataka and the Supreme Court. Uh, he has served as additional advocate general for Karnataka from April 2016 to April 2018 and has been appointed a Michael Scurry in several matters of public importance. Um, Dr. Sondi was designated a senior advocate at the young age of 38 years. Uh, he's a graduate of National Law School of India University in Bangalore, where he is also a visiting faculty. He has taught constitutional law, arbitration, and professional ethics. Uh, Dr. Sondi, it is it's a privilege to welcome you today. Uh, over to you now. Thank you, Apurva. My thanks to Mr. Anand Grover and colleagues at the Leaflet for this privilege to be able to share my thoughts in response to Justice Oka's fascinating speech on the role played by three great social reformers and thinkers whose thoughts and lives are relevant even a hundred years after. May I also say how refreshing it is to have a panel where a sitting judge of the Supreme Court is able to share his thoughts on a matter outside the black and white of the law. So you spoke with restraint, understandably, but there are many messages for us to take from your speech today. And I will try and respond to some of those, especially those that are between the lines. When we look at the lives of Justice Ranade, Tilak and Gokhale, certainly these individuals were not perfect. In fact, nobody is. And a lot of things that they thought, said and did must be seen in the context of their socio-political times. But that said, I think we've already gleaned from Justice Oka's speech the fact that a lot of their thoughts were actually ahead of their times and were timeless in that sense. One aspect that struck me about Justice Ranade's life was his political liberalism. The fact that as a sitting judge, he could also be a liberal. I mean, all of us as counsels like liberal judges because they give us relief in court. But I think this is a different liberalism. This is a liberalism of thought and spirit, and how refreshing that is to hear. The fact that Justice Ranade was one of the founding members of the Indian National Congress and his political avatar as a judge is also striking. Of course, as it was pointed out that thereafter the British government prohibited any such political posts uh, for public servants, and thereafter uh, Mr. Ranade, Justice Ranade became an observer. But it's interesting to see that he also had a political avatar. His role in the Sabha as a proponent of arbitration strikes me as also something that is so far sighted, really a, a mediator of disputes. Today, under the crushing burden of litigation and dockets in India, for somebody to have thought of arbitration slash mediation as a means of resolution of semi-formal disputes at that time, I think is really something for us to dwell on. He was a rationalist, but the, I think the most striking part of his personality, which came through in Justice Oka's speech was 
the part where he quotes Jesus of Nazareth, who takes up the cross to say that the pain and injury are nothing by the side of the principle for which they are endured. That the pain and injury are nothing by the side of the principle for which they are endured. I think those words will stay with me. If any of us have tried to be principled in our lives, we know that one cannot be principled in a vacuum and that there is pain and sacrifice to go with it. But it's worth it if one tries to do the right thing. And I think those words really strike me as a very key part of Justice Ranade's personality. Coming to Tilak, of course, a reformist, a firebrand, an educationist, a multifaceted personality, but his role as a critic of the government, I think is most telling. You have heard his thoughts on sedition and that conversation interestingly is going on even today. Even today you have Tilaks who are facing sedition unjustly. And you know that the plaque at the Chief Justice's court in the Bombay High Court memorializes Tilak's trial and his gallant stand on the matter. And there was an interesting part in Justice Oka's speech where Tilak is quoted as saying that British rulers do not have a monopoly of wisdom. It's a very interesting and a subtle way of saying that nobody really has a monopoly of wisdom and whether or not one likes criticism or thought which is contrarian, it cannot then lead to a misuse of the law uh, as was done in Tilak's case. And he says, Tilak says that when a jury is asked if one man thinks that an article is seditious and he says, yes, that's not enough. That's really, I think, the heckler's veto that one talks about today. And I suspect that is something that the Supreme Court may have to consider in the ongoing case relating to the hijab. And there again, I think the philosophy of Tilak all those years ago still rings true today. Uh, he was a free thinker, quite obviously. His ideas of Swaraj were firebrand, as Mr. Venkateshan pointed out. He took a more extreme view of things than Ranade and Gokhale, who were regarded as more moderate. Uh, as more moderate. Uh, he was a non-conformist. His thoughts on having the equivalent of a Hyde Park situation in India, where somebody can step up and criticize the government as freely as they want, is, is very interesting and in some ways ahead of its times. Look then at the life and times of Gokhale, a nationalist, but also a localist with a great focus on the concept of Swadeshi that we speak of even today, a libertarian, somebody who very importantly referred to the importance of separation of powers. Justice Oka referred to that in his speech, the need for a separate or a separation of executive and judicial functions. How important is that? debate today. His role as an anti-casteist, I think, struck me also as a very important part of his personality in those times. Uh, his reference to Neville Chamberlain's background and how far he went, I think, showed, again, his liberal and equanimous outlook on society. And here, in fact, uh, Gokhale overlaps with Tilak. I happened to get a biography of uh, Lokamanya Tilak written by A.K. Bhagwat and G.P. Pradhan, where they refer to a conference hosted under the presidentship of Maharaj Sayaji Rao Gaikwad of Baroda, where Tilak moved a resolution that the Congress should enlist the support of the Bahujan and spoke out strongly against the practice of untouchability. He, in fact, said, and I may quote, amid deafening cheers, Tilak declared, if a God were to tolerate untouchability, I would not recognize him as God at all. Strong words on a social evil of the time. And in that sense, I would think these great thinkers at one level also overlapped with another great philosopher from Maharashtra, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Um, there was a reference made to uh, Gokhale's suggestion that while participating in Swadeshi, one should not create ill will 
is that not really what uh, even uh, Baba Sahib said when he spoke up against what he called the anarchy, <clears throat> uh, the grammar of anarchy when it comes to violent resistance. And in that sense, I find that there is an interesting overlap, not just amongst the three uh, tall stalwarts that Justice Oka spoke of, but even with Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar in his references to the grammar of anarchy. And tellingly, the comment about the role of the press as a custodian of public interest and public right. I mean, how important is that aspect today? Again, uh, a tremendous foresight uh, that the press is in fact supposed to be a custodian and a protector and a voice for rights and not a collaborator with the government. And this is something that Gokhale had said all those years ago. And that strikes me again as being extremely relevant and telling at this time. Of course, as Justice Oka mentioned, these thinkers also differed from time to time. In fact, uh, Tilak was most trenchant in his criticism. I found another passage in this book where Tilak responds to the role of Gokhale in his thought process with the Congress and how they ought to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the role of the British government and the need for Indians to come and serve in government service. And this is what Tilak said about Gokhale, and I quote, it is necessary to point out how owing to the temptation of government service, young men turn their backs on the national cause and thus to expose the hideous and anti-national -na nature, the anti-national nature of that service. If the leaders of the nation want young men to devote themselves to the service of the country, they must advise young men in such a way as to inspire in them a feeling of renunciation in regard to government service. If Mr. Gokhale is not prepared to give this bold lead, he should better refrain from giving advice." Unquote. These were the strong words that Tilak used for Gopal Krishna Gokhale, treating a call to government service as in fact being anti-national. That is how diametrically opposed they were on certain positions. But I think it's important to notice, and Mr. Venkateshan made this point, that they differed on principle. There was never really a personal animosity that really came through between them. And these were tall leaders involved in the inception and the growth of the Indian National Congress. I can say today, the Congress party can do well to look at the thought processes the difference of opinion, the diversity of opinion that these tall leaders brought, but were yet able to keep their relationship intact. In fact, I want to read one last passage, which again emanates from Justice Oka's reference to how sportingly and graciously Justice Ranade responded to the rather strong criticism that Tilak made of him. And I quote, Tilak's patriotism and sacrifice are unquestioned in intellect and learning, he is no whit less than I am. I shall not therefore be so bold as to deny the faults that he sees in me and my party. The proper use of Tilak's article should be to make us introspective and to try and remove whatever faults we have. If we do this, we have to thank Tilak rather than to blame him. This shows the graciousness with which two great thinkers were able to take on one another but without getting personal or vitriolic. Even if Tilak was seen as using harsh language at times, the response of Ranade, I think, strikes me as being statesmanlike, something, again, that all of us can learn from, political leaders can learn from, anybody in a position of authority can learn from, to be able to take criticism with introspection, as was pointed, to take it on the chin, but not get into a toxic debate where one gets personal and vitriolic with the other. The references to the right to education, this was really something new to me. I was oblivious of this, that this was something that Gokhale thought of, and it took all these years for us to bring an amendment. I think that is a tremendous constitutional contribution made uh, in this regard. Ultimately, if we look at the lives of these three individuals, they had the foresight. They were nationalists in the true sense at a crucial time when we were still fighting for our political independence. Most importantly, they were free-spirited. 
I think that is something that comes through while looking at the lives of these three individuals in Justice Oka's speech, their biographies show us that whether they held a position that was not compatible with someone else's, they had the liberty and strength and conviction of their thought and ideology to be able to stand by it, even at great personal cost, which we saw was directly the case with, with Tilak and uh, his trial for his two trials for sedition. And I think that is where the message comes through to us today and links up with the topic of the day, which is a vision of independent India. We are not just looking at a historical uh, study here. We're looking at a vision and a critique of independent India today. And these thoughts of free-spirited individuals and their lives and their choices, I think are the real message to us more than any other philosophical aspect of their lives. The fact that we need to be free-spirited and independent in our thinking and in our character. That's a message for citizens at large. It's a message for us lawyers. It's a message for judges. It's a message for anybody in uh, a position of difference. And I think it is that independence of thought uh, that is underlined in today's discussion while looking at the lives of these uh, three individuals. It is not my place to comment on aspects of independence of the bench. But I must say it pains me when sometimes I hear people speak of judicial independence with a sense of nostalgia. It should not be that that is something that's behind us. It's in fact integral and part of the basic structure of our constitution. But I can speak with some confidence about the independence of the bar. And I think that is the message that I take away from today's conversation, the need for the bar to remain independent in thought, in ideology, in intellect, in spirit. Um, you know, when we speak of young advocates going independent, we don't mean it literally in the sense that somebody is going independent from their senior and setting up a chamber. That, of course, is the case. But it is really going independent in your thought process, your ability to express yourself, the importance of the uh, speech and expression that all these three philosoph philosophers emphasized. I think that to me, as a member of the bar and other friends from the bar, especially younger members, is something that I will hold close to my heart, that if we as practitioners are able to uh, take on that spirit of independence, then we can really have a vision of independent India. After all, the legal system and us practitioners, we are part and parcel of that very important facet of our uh, socio-politics. And there, I think this discussion today is extremely enriching. And I thank Justice Oka for his thoughts today. And I thank you once again for this invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the talk and the, the amazing thoughts that were brought in. I would like to thank everybody present here who has contributed to this lively discussion. I extend my thanks to Ms. Vishwanath for moderating this event with a prom and to the panelists, Honorable Justice of the Supreme Court, Mr. Oka and Senior Advocate Dr. Aditya Sondi for your insightful remarks thoughtful contribution and dynamic debate contouring the idea of independent India. Thank you for taking out the time from your busy schedules to interact with us today. I would also like to thank the Leaflet team, Indira Jaising, Anand Grover, Mr. Venkateshan, Pratik Bakshi, Ritu Devan, Roshmi Goswami, Vineet Bhalla, Shweta Velayadhan, Hamza Laktawala, Parasnath Singh, Shiv Shankar Santosh, and Sabagurmat the team that has been critical in providing the consistent background support which ensured that these events and especially today's events have been carried out in a seamless fashion. Lastly, but most importantly, 
I would like to thank the audience who have shown us support in incredible numbers across all our social media platforms, from Facebook and YouTube to Zoom. Your interest in issues such as this is what drives the Leaflet's work, and we hope that you continue to support us in all our ventures, and together we can promote the aims of the Leaflet to uphold the values of Constitution First. Thank you, everybody, and have a great evening. Thank you.